We're um, going to be uh, studying the topic of worship again. Uh, let me ask you something, all right? Uh, what I'm about to say is true of me, and I wonder if it's true of you as well. Uh, and it's this. For most believers, worship, Sunday morning worship, public worship with the congregation, is the core of our spiritual lives. It's the highest expression of our spiritual life. Uh, it's our cornerstone to our relationship with God. Uh, it's that one spiritual discipline that most of us are the most uh, regular and, uh, you know, long-term. It's the thing that keeps it all together for us. Would you say that's true of you? Yeah, I think so. Uh, and so that's why we're spending so much time with worship. I know that there are some pastors who will preach even more messages about worship, and they'll even have worship conferences. Uh, and, you know, it's so important, and yet we still struggle with it in a variety of ways. Uh, we struggle to pay attention. We struggle to stay focused while we're worshiping. Every physical transaction throws us off. I uh, had my hand in my pocket, and I was feeling around on my little purse that I keep my hearing aids in. And I felt something hard. I says, I thought I took my hearing aid out. I, I've got it on my ears. And I realized I was messing around with the, uh, the zipper. So, you know, for about five seconds, hey, my attention was gone. <laughs> Fortunately, it wasn't during the singing, but, uh, you know, it's still a distraction. Uh, some people have come to me about all kinds of physical things. They don't like the lighting in the room. Uh, big one is the temperature and the airflow, the seating, uh, the music, the lack of movement by the speaker. I have one young adult say, why don't you pastors ever walk around when you're up there? You know? Um, and yet, for generations, they said, stay still. In fact, in some of those churches, they had the pastor standing in this little pedestal type of a thing, and he was all wrapped around. There was no way he could move around except to fall out the front, okay? But uh, somebody said, why don't you move around? Uh, so anyway, uh, we have all these struggles with interest, understanding how to participate, and struggling mostly to enjoy it, and then ultimately, whether for me, whether I've done a good enough job before God, for him. Um, well, these are growing pains. You know what they say about physical pains, right? Physical pains are good, because they tell you what you need to be careful of and work on. And I think we can have the same thing with spiritual pains. And so we struggle in worship, and it tells you where to focus in, where to work harder, where to do things different, where to find solutions. And so that's what we're talking about um, worship again. And today our passage is going to come from John chapter 4. Uh, we know it as the story of the woman at the well. And in this passage, we're going to find Jesus' most important suggestion for worship improvement. And so we're going to be focusing on the last half, in, well, actually, the middle portion of the story, but we are going to uh, spend time uh, on uh, more than just that part of it. And so uh, if uh, you will turn to John chapter 4, and uh, we're going to start way back at verse 3, because this is where he starts to head up into Samaria. Um, so follow along, and sometimes I'm going to emphasize certain words. Sometimes I'm going to throw in a word of explanation. John 4, 3. He left Judea and departed again for Galilee. So he's going north. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to the town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. Now, that means that it was a high noon, 12 o'clock, because they start 
with 6 a.m. being the first hour. And a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will never not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Now we're going to come to the verses we're going to concentrate on. And Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman said, answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Hint of sarcasm there. The woman's shocked and she's embarrassed and she's quick and she tries to change the subject. Verse 19. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. So the woman deftly, skillfully acknowledges Jesus is a prophet and then brings up a religious question for this prophet. She asked him about the debate between the Jews and the Samaritans, okay? Which is the correct mountain for worship, she asks. And so she throws him this topic, and she'll hope that he will move away from talking about her personal life. In actuality, she's not interested. She's probably far from religious or devout or spiritual. But Jesus knows exactly what she's doing, and yet he doesn't rebuke her. He takes up her evasiveness, and the result is that he gives all of us some very important instructions about worship. This is what he says. Verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Now, Jesus is certainly not a part of the Realtors Association, right? You know what the realtors all say. What three words? Location, location, location. Well, Jesus says, location, 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 all right? Neither in Jerusalem or uh, in Gerizim, your mountain. Uh, so this is not the ultimate issue. Verse 22, he says, you worship what you do not know we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. Now, while location is not important, correct knowledge and understanding is important about worship, and the relationship with God is important. So now Jesus will move on to give her the new standard for worship, a standard which I call that liberates our worship. And he's going to liberate it from becoming overly physical, and local, he's going to liberate it to be about spirit and truth. Verse 23, but the hour is coming, and now is here, or I should say, is now here, when the true worshipers, okay, who are the true worshipers? He's using this word to say, it isn't just the Jews, it isn't the Samaritans, it's everybody who pursues God, whom God will save, so it includes the Gentiles. True worshipers 
will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. So the Father wants these things, uh, wants these kind of people to do these things. He is seeking, and then verse 24, Jesus summarizes it again, restates it, and makes it very clear why. Because God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. In other words, he's saying, God is not physical. And so don't get stuck, don't get phys- fixated on the physical. And you guys have made a big deal out of mountains and locations, and it isn't about that. And someday, you know, Jerusalem will be destroyed, the temple will be destroyed, and they're not going to be able to, how are they going to worship if they're fixed on a location? Remember, way back in the Old Testament, in the Ten Commandments, the Second Commandment, what did God say? Don't make any carved images. And it says in Deuteronomy 4, it says it's because when God spoke to them on Sinai, God had no form. So don't try to make a carved image. And the note in the English uh, Standard Version Study Bible for the Second Commandment says this, he has no physical form and should not be thought of as being localized in worn. Back in those days, you know, they would carve an idol and they thought that idol was the resting place in which that little god would reside. The Chinese feel the same way, right? We have a little god for the kitchen. We have a little god for uh, the family altar. We have all these things. And we think they are actually located right there. And so that's why he's trying to break them away from this kind of a thing. Now, the context of the conversation is so important. It tells us how to properly uh, understand what is meant by worship in spirit and in truth. Uh, And it tells us negatively and positively. Negatively, you know, don't fixate on physical things, on externals. Uh, Don't uh, try to uh, think that God is stuck in a particular place and we can only worship him on particular mountains or in the Holy Land or in the church worship center. We're free to worship God anywhere and everywhere. Remember when Jesus first started his ministry? One of the first things he did was he threw out, when he went into the temple, the money changers and the people who sold the animals. In fact, this was a action that he did twice. He did it also again at the end of his ministry. And you know, that's kind of strange because they needed those guys. So they thought, because people would come from all over Israel and they would arrive at the temple and they needed an animal to sacrifice. And that was the whole thing. They came to make a sacrifice. And then not only did they need an animal to sacrifice, they had to buy the animal. But see, they might not have the right kind of money because you can only use temple money. It's kind of like when you go to Dodger Stadium and they charge you $20 for a hot dog and you got no other place to get it. Well, you had to buy these animals. They were the right animals and you had to use temple money. So you had to bring out your Roman currency then they would make some money off of you, and then you would buy the animal. But this was essential worship. And Jesus comes in and he throws out all these physical things. And he says, you know what? This house is to be what? A house of prayer for all nations. And so he's talking about the spiritual side of it and turning them away from the physical side of it. And this is very useful because there's so many man-made rituals, there's so many external expressions, and they're helpful. 
they're useful. They are a ways that help us to express ourselves. They teach us things, but we're not to get locked into them. Okay? Um, we were standing earlier, and I looked around, and I see Jerry. And I know at his age and in his health, you know, if he needs to sit down, that's great. It's just as good. Okay? Uh, these are to help us to show reverence. Okay? But you don't have to do it if there's a reason for you not to do it. See, that means that we use these things as tools, but they don't become ends in themselves. And it's the same thing with all kinds of things. Um, some of the most devout denominations in the past, they had the women sit in one area and the men sit in the other area, okay? You couldn't worship together, why? Who's gonna get distracted? All the young men. I'm trying to be nice to the older men, okay? But, you know, it was just a problem of distraction. And so while it's a useful device, it's not all, be all, and end all. And yet, over the years, we've seen so many arguments about external stuff. Uh, most recently, we fight over drums, right? And before we fought over drums, you know what we fought over? We fought over pianos, because pianos were first used in bars. Yeah, and so when they brought the piano to church, people were shocked. And you know what they fought over before that? Organs, because they were secular instruments first. And so, you know, these are things that help us, but they do not control us. Um, on another level of application of becoming too physical, one that applies to a person like me, sometimes on a Sunday morning, I'm just too busy. And I don't get a chance to really worship. And I have in the past, on a special Christian holiday, I would go to another church on a Saturday night or something like that, and I would catch an extra worship so that I can worship without distraction, without responsibility, you know, leave my cell phone in the car, which half the time I forget and I leave in the car anyway. But, uh, you know, just so I can truly worship instead of being busy and physically involved. And so uh, there's all these different things. And so Jesus says, I'm liberating you from this. The tool is your friend, but it is not your master. And so that's the first thing, that outward worship becomes a problem. Here's the even worse danger, okay? When we use it to substitute for true worship. Because what happens is sometimes we use the outward, what? To be a substitute. In college, sometimes I would show up in class because I knew that that teacher took role. But you know what? Was I listening? No. I'd sit behind big guys so that he couldn't see me. You know, I'd be doing some other thing, right? But my name is checked off. You see, Jesus said in Matthew 15, 8, they worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And he's quoting the Old Testament. And so sometimes we worship externally. We go through the motions. We fulfill the ritual. But you know what? We're insincere. We're pretending to worship, and that's deceptive. And that's why I say that's even worse than when we mess up and uh, we're doing that. We substitute the physical show for the actual heart worship, okay? And so let's talk now about what is really primary. What does it mean to worship God in spirit? Well, we, we kind of already began because when Jesus says, they worship me with their lips, but what is far from me? The heart, right? And that's what he's looking for. Uh, 
the song we were singing earlier. Uh, if I can find the words. For the heart of worship. Um, and it talks about stripping away the music. You see? Those are the externals. Those are the tools. Those are the ways we help. I've got some friends who are tone deaf. And I would stand next to them and I would sing. And they were so tone deaf, they were so far off key that they would mess me up. But you know what? I'm still going to worship with them and next to them. Some of them were my best friends. You know, but the music was stripped away. Boy, it was really kill. And it says, you know what? I simply come longing to bring something that's worth blessing your heart with. Okay? I'll bring you more than a song because that's not what you require. You search much deeper within through the ways things appear. You see, when he says worship in spirit and truth, this is what he's talking about. Going deeper and stripping away that which is false. This woman had been lying to Jesus, pretending, you know, that she had no husband, and Jesus knew it. She pretended that she cared which mountain you worshipped in. She was enveloped in this falsehood. And Jesus was going to set her free and say, look, I already know all about you. You don't have to pretend. Let's strip it away because I accept you. I'm not going to rebuke you. I'm not going to walk away from you. I still want you to hear the good news, and I still want your town to hear the good news. And so he stays engaged with her. And then the verse says, I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing that I've made it. I've made it about Jerusalem. I made it about Gerizim. I made it about drums. I made it about the temperature room. I made it about everything except what it's all about, which is God. And it says, "You are the king of endless worth." Wow, when you think about things like that, it really helps you to worship. And so, this is what it's getting at when we talk about having ourselves in worship. Jesus says, how should we love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength? How should we worship the Lord our God deep within with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength? And so this is a kind of internal, you know, process that comes out in worship. This is what needs to come. And so he says, worship in spirit, and then these two go together. You know that old American song, love and marriage? Love and marriage, love and marriage, go together like what? Horse and carriage, okay? Uh, there are some things that naturally go together. And Jesus says, in worship, spirit and truth, go together. There's only one preparation keeping the two together. And so we need to have truth in there um, all the time, simultaneously. Uh, and we don't want to be like this woman where, you know, we're saying one thing and we're doing another. Um, there's two situations from the Gospels that illustrate what we're talking about. And, and they're, they're very useful, so I'm going to share both of them. Uh, remember when Jesus took his disciples into the temple and he stood and he watched this old widow come. And she had nothing left except two pennies. And she walked in and she gave her offering and her little offering was nothing. Because before she came, all these people were coming with their big bags of money, right? And tossing it into the temple treasury. And yet he said, you know what? Here is a woman who has given from her heart. Here is a woman who has given with great devotion and in an act of great faith, a wholehearted 
worship. Here is worship in spirit. Mark 12, 41 to 44. The other time is a parable, and it's from Luke 18. And he talks about two people coming into the temple. On the one hand, there is the Pharisee. And he comes and he takes center stage. And he is praying like this. God, will you look at that tax collector over there hiding in the corner? Thank you, God, that you made me me and not him. Sound like a children's song, okay? And he says, I am not doing the kind of things that he does. I am not the kind of person he is. And then Jesus has the tax collector speak up, and he's praying too. And it says he took his fist and he beat his chest, and he asked God for mercy. And he was being so truthful, but he was also coming from his deepest heart, his feeling about himself. He knows he's a sinner. And by beating his chest, he's agreeing, I am worthy of judgment and punishment. But be merciful to me, O God. And Jesus said what? He says, guess who left having worship? Guess who of these two has made God happy? Well, it's the one who worshiped in spirit and truth. And so... Uh, this is the story that he told. Uh, truth is that we will follow through. This is one of our applications. A lot of times we say we're going to worship, but we don't follow through. We wish, we think, we plan, we hope, but we don't follow through. We don't show up. We don't get down to the worship. You know, we're just going through the motion. You come tired? Grab a cup of coffee. We got a Keurig in the printing room, okay? And get yourself amped up. We've had people start ministries, coffee and donuts, for people to arrive at church so that they are going to be ready to worship. Uh, you don't like the music? Don't take it out on God. Worship anyway. You know, just like that widow who gave her two cents and she was sacrificing, sometimes... Sacrifice is the thing we can give to God that is most meaningful. Some of you come tired. Some of you don't sleep well at night, and you come and you're very tired. And you say, I'm still going to come. That's very sacrificial. And that counts with God an awful lot. When I see sometimes women who don't speak, spouses who don't speak one language, accompany the other spouse into a worship so that that spouse can understand in the language. That's sacrificial worshiping, okay? Uh, you might not get a whole lot for yourself, but you care that your spouse who needs the spiritual development is getting the worship that the spouse needs. And so you need to follow through in these very practical ways. And we want to follow through in the way that's congruent to how uh, we're feeling what we're going through. James 5.13 says this, Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. So we need actual follow through, and we need to make it congruent. Let me give you a tip. We're all different. Some of you are really into Bible, Okay. Others of you are really into the music. Others are really into the prayer. Focus on that. Do your very best at that part. And really use that to help the rest of your worship. If you don't know what really makes you tick spiritually, what is your strength, what is the thing that nurtures you the most, you know, it's a good time to stop, think, and find out. What is it? For some of you, your spiritual life is helping the poor and needy. And that will be the engine that drives your spiritual development. Some of you, you like me, nature. I mean, hardly a day goes by I see something in nature that just doesn't make me say, man, God, 
you sure are having too much fun doing this stuff. You know, and I just feel the wonder of God, and it's so nice, you know. It's too bad I live in the city. Otherwise, I'd be even happier. But, uh, you know, you want to find out what it is that makes you most worshipful and then learn to become strong in it and let it, you know, become your strength in worship. Um, really, and, and this is a word to those who have been in the church all their lives. Because if we start off young, you know, worship can become a kind of a tired thing for us. We've done it for so long, we've done it so much, and so it's no longer something that is new, and uh, we are just doing the same physical things over and over. And God is saying, you know, you need some liberation, you need a new perspective, you need some rejuvenation, some internal stimulation. I want you to worship in spirit and truth. And so when I come, I ask, what is it in my life that keeps me from being 100% worshipful? Is it because I'm tired? Is it because my tools for hearing don't work right? Is it because, you know, I'm worried about how well put together my sermon is? What is it that drags me down? And I try to deal with it. I don't just go through the motion and fulfill my time here, but try to worship even though I've got these things that I should be worried about. Push it out of my mind for the hour and a half that I'm here. Uh, so we don't want to be like that smug Pharisee, you know, thinking our worship's good enough because at least I'm doing better than the person next to me. We want to be like that widow who gave of her two pennies, gave from the heart, gave so enthusiastically and sacrificially. We want to be uh, like that tax collector who comes honest with God and asks for what he needs, unlike this Samaritan woman. Let me give you some practical things. Um, before worship begins, take the time of preparation and use it for self-examination. If you think of anything that happened during the week that kind of bent you out of shape, spiritually, anger, lust, unforgiveness, things that you did wrong, take the time to confess. We ask people to do that before communion, but really we should do it before our worship because we come to the holy God. We can be like that tax collector who beats his chest and goes out blessed by God. Um, another thing that helps you might find a favorite prayer. We've been giving you these focus verses. You know, one of these can turn into a great prayer that you can use each time to prepare yourself for worship, to kind of get you here, get you present, get you thinking, get you spiritually ready. You know, the prayer I use comes from Peter where it talks about men of old who are led by the Holy Spirit. And I, I choose that prayer because when I come up to preach, I want God to just kind of take over and lead me along so that I will get all of us to where he wants us to go instead of me trying to control it and lead it. During worship, I try to keep in mind that God is watching. You've heard... Michael say, God is the audience, okay? Pastor isn't the audience. The worship leaders aren't the audience. Only God is the audience. And so I keep in mind that God is watching. And then, during the worship, I really try to get into the songs, even the ones I don't know. One time, we were up here, and Tim was leading worship. And he led us in all these new songs that with my hearing, I couldn't sing along and I couldn't understand. But I was doing my very best. And after Tim was done, he says, Pastor Kim looks like he's really having fun. Well, I was, but I was also struggling. Okay, but you think about the words as it describes God. And if you meditate with it, 
with part of your mind. It really reminds you of what a great God and what a good God he it is. And so you're not just doing the activity. You're not just being physical. But you are worshiping in spirit. And so you can really have a good time. You know, after I ran my first marathon, everything changed for me. After I ran my first marathon, once a week, I would have what my first health coach said, your long, slow day. Long, slow day means you take a very long run and run it at a very slow pace. So I would drive out to the Rose Bowl. And each time you go around the Rose Bowl, it's three plus miles. And I would try to go around four times, okay? Basically do a half marathon once a week, in addition to the other two days that I would run less. Well, after I finished my first marathon, I would go out there. And guess what? It wasn't all that hard because I had already run 26.2. So 13 was easy. And I could run it fast. And you know what? I started to feel like an athlete. And I started to rejoice in my body. Now, you have to understand, I grew up as a chubby immigrant kid. I did not participate in sports. So I always ask God, why am I physically so unendowed? Okay. And, and so, you know, all through school, we play football. What do I do? I play line. You just have to stand there and try to block somebody, right? So you don't have to have a skilled position. And so in the beginning, when I started running, my trainer says, you run so slow, most people walk faster than you. Well, what can I do? i got to start somewhere. But over time, I got to the point where I was thrilled because those 13 miles were my personal time. And I rejoiced in God working his work through me in the enemy. Well, you know, we're on many journeys in our lives, and we're all on the spiritual journey as well. And you may be just starting to learn to run. You may be already getting ready for a full marathon. Maybe you have gone through, spiritually speaking, in your worship, past your first marathon. And whenever you can come in, you are ready to worship. And the whole thing is just a wonderful, glorious time for you. Wherever we are, God can lead us forward if we will keep doing it. And you've got to put aside comments like, you sing off key. You mess me up. Or you've got to put aside things like, it's too cold in here or it's too hot in here. And you just keep working on it. Get past the physical and let God bring you to the point where you worship in spirit and truth together. And you'll be liberated and you can come, and all of our sinfulness, all of our inadequacies will find that we can be confident that God's going to look down on us like he did with the tax collector, and it says he walked out of there justified. Isn't that great? I mean, he's a great God. He wants our worship, and he's not like some old parent who's going to come wrap you on the knuckles because you're not doing it right. He's going to work with you, give you the time, but we have to cooperate. Let's pray. Father, um, thank you for this unexpected teaching that this woman and her attempts to avoid you, this Samaritan woman, caused you to teach about. Even though you didn't spend a lot of time on it, yet it is so precious and so vital for us as your children. So Lord, help us. May the things that are in your word continue to live in us and bring us to the point where we are living worshipers all the time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.